guys? Brian Chapel back with you, Crappie Connection. I got the one, the only, the Hammer Hayden here with me today, man. Heck yeah. It's been a little while. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. We're going to get on here today and we're going to talk about some of the strategies going into the fall, locating some fall time crappie, some of the tips and tricks that you might dis- disclose today for us on how you're catching some of these fall crappie. And, you know, we know what you're doing, Hayden. But we want to hear it even some yeah, more. Yeah. How you catching some of the little tricks and right. how you going about locating some crappie. But uh, I don't think you need an introduction, but if you want, you can. As he said, I'm Hayden Jeffries. Um, I'm a full time guide, been tournament fishing the last few years. Um, yeah, I'd say that. <laughs> That's pretty good. That'll work. <clears throat> you know, live scope's a big thing. A lot of guys are utilizing it. and i'm utilizing it and i know you're utilizing it and going into the fall when you sit down in in the morning time what are the first things that you're going to do kind of walk through what you're doing whenever you're going to any body of water and we'll talk about barnett of course some but now i know you've fished a bunch of different lakes across the country as well but first time in the morning what are you looking at when you're starting your mornings? Yeah, so I think I'm even going to have to start before I get to the lake in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm always going to have to check the weather. That's going to be yeah. my first, you know, um, I want to see what the wind's doing, see what areas of the lake I can actually fish that day, um, see if there's any kind of weather you have to play or dodge. Um, this time of year, you know, pop-up showers can happen at any time. Yeah. Um, but then once, you know, I, I pick the location I want to go, no matter where that is, I mean, I kind of start getting in there. It seems like in the fall, I'm going to start looking more towards the deeper water. Um, a mm-hmm. lot of fish, you know, they, they've spawned, they've came back out, they've set up on shallow brush, they've hang, hung out for the summer, and that lake starts losing oxygen, you know, farther in the summer you go. And so those fish are kind of falling out with that. Um, so I'm starting to look in that deeper water, let's say 15 to 25 foot of water would be my good starting point basis. Um, a lot of structure comes into play during the fall you know seeing a lot of fish sitting on big stumps and brush piles whatever it may be Um, i'd go in the standing timber some but i try to stay out of it as much as possible just because it's it's hard to navigate um let's see but let's say all right you're out there you picked your location of the lake i want to know like your screen distance (laughs) and some of the basics that you're doing from the putting that trolling motor down and start looking for fish what are you looking for when you're looking at your screen yeah so most of the summer our fish are sitting on structure so i'm looking for structure but you start getting into the fall and you start to get some of those fish breaking off structure um so there's some fish in open water um if i first sit down on my screen i'm probably going to jump out to 50 feet somewhere in there um when i have people with me i might even start a little bit closer than that just to where I can kind of start teaching them what we're seeing, what's coming across it, um, start breaking that down a little bit. And then I'm just going to start covering, you know, whatever area what of the lake. You, what are you breaking down to them? Um, I have a little 15 or 20 minute course that, that we do every Let's morning uh, that just helps them get an understanding of what, you know, what this sonar actually is, what we're looking at in the column. Um, so I'll tell them, you know, we'll get out there in the morning. I always catch the first two fish. That's something. I've been guiding for a little over two years now, and I've always caught the first two fish. Um, It gives me a basis, you know, to understand what these fish might be doing on that given day. And so I'm always going to pick the pole up and and get them up, get everybody to the front of the boat. Let's, you know, have our little course here. And I'm going to tell them, okay, this is a scope. Just like you're looking through the scope of a gun, that's kind of what we're looking at right here. I guess, can I say gun? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. It is what it is. Yeah. And... It's a scope, so I start explaining to them, you know, we're not looking at a big wide cone of water. We're looking, you know, just like you were with a scope. You're looking at a really tight section of that water column, and, I, you know, I'm going to show them zero feet. Okay, we're right here. This is this is that trolling motor sitting in front of you. And I'll show them, you know, as I pan the trolling motor, it's, um, it's changing what we're looking at, the bottom contour yeah. structure or whatever it may be. Um, that's where I start. I start bare basic, and we get that down. And then I'm going to pick a pole up, and I'm going to say, okay, you know, that trolling motor's right there, so if I take this bait and I set it over here, we're never going to see it. Yeah. If I take this bait and I set it right there, here it comes. So that, then they kind of get a grasp of, you know, what we're doing there. 
then I'm going to start easing down through there and see if I can't pick a fish out. And once I pick it out, I'm going to show it to him. As soon as I see the fish, I'm going to be like, okay, look, this is what, you know, we're approaching a target. I'm going to start slowing down, getting everything set up, and I'm going to try to get this fish to, say, 10 feet. Some days 12. It just depends. Somewhere in that, you know, window. And I'm going to ease in there and show him, you know, here comes my bait. I'm going to stop way above the fish, make sure everything's ready, and then I'm going to ease down to him. And um, it, it always helps me to start my trip off with my little class. Um, it, it cuts a lot of the curve for them to where they're not having to try to understand what we're doing. I gave them a, you know, a basis of what we're doing. And then we just run with it. Um, mm-hmm. I'll catch those two fish, see how those fish reacted, how they bit. I might even get up and change a bait if I didn't like the way something happened. Um, some days I fish for 30 minutes and I don't catch two fish. Right. And that's, that's the days that, you know, it gets interesting. Um, you got to work a little harder those days. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand them the pole and then we're going to start trying to replicate what, you know, they just saw. Um, and it usually doesn't take people long. They're able to kind of start picking up um, what we're doing. And You know, it's always kind of entertaining. And, you know, we've done it for many hours now, but they see that fish a little bit further away the first thing they want to do is what go right <laughs> move right <laughs> and like, and you have to right you have to the remind screen. them you know that you're that you're seeing distance we're not seeing left and right all of our left and right's in that trolling motor and i think you know guiding a lot of your clients have a hard time understanding the left and right aspect because they're not running the trolling motor mm-hmm. you know when you're yeah. when you've got your foot on the trolling motor and you're panning it back and forth you can tell okay i'm turning right this fish is going right or yeah. and you can kind of feel it more than just if i'm holding a rod watching a screen yes you can look up at the trolling motor but a lot of times they'll forget to do that and so you know you kind of have to remind them hey look that's that's just a little farther out what is in your mind what is the most common mistake people do it's probably that right right there i would say but what would be another mistake that people first thing they typically do and and, you know we're just trying to help people out by saying this but what would be probably the most common mistake an angler does when they first try to use live scope in your boat i know probably pull the right with the right turn there but i'm gonna say um they're looking for their bait a lot like you know i can't find my bait where's my bait yeah Um, my bait's not on the screen right now and and when we're approaching a fish and the baits you know i'm not really as much worried about where the bait is when we're coming in there i'm more worried about making sure you know this big boat's coming here and settling down in the right way um the bait's gonna you know come out from under the boat or when they drop it in they i just have to really teach to get that bait in the cone with the fish you know we've got our fish right here that's our target um, we'll never see our bait until it's in, you know, target with that fish, and then it all lines up, and it you get to watch the fish come up and bite it. Yeah, it's always really cool to watch people's first time they're using live scope, and they're like, "This thing is just so amazing." And I mean, it is. There's no doubt. And but, and I guess we got kind of going on this learning the live scope system, which is fine. I like the subject, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> yeah, it, but we'll run with that right now. Yeah, let's go. And, but what are the, some of the mindset that you have when you're teaching people that kind of helps them out and say, oh, that kind of makes sense? Do you ever have those moments with people you say, hey, this is what's going on, and you can see the light bulb go off in the client's eyes or and even how they move sometimes? Yeah, yeah. most of it's in the left and right. I mean, that seems to be the biggest learning curve as far as getting everything lined up. And I, I'll take the rod. I'll be like, let me, you know. Let me have that first second. Let me see if I can show it to you. And I'll find something we can see, you know, a tree or whatever it might be. And I'm going to point the scope at him and be like, okay, you know, we're looking right here. Mm-hmm. This this is where that is. This is, you know, you can look at the troll motor. It's right there. And I'll set the bait over here. Yeah. Where's the bait? To the left. Okay, you got it. So what do I need to do to get it back to that? Let's come right with it. And, you know, it's going to come back into that cone with, with the uh, whatever your target is. I would say that's definitely the, the I deal with that most is just getting getting everything lined up. And there's a lot to line up. There's a lot of moving parts. I mean, it, there's definitely a learning curve behind getting all that to come together. Do you use a zero offset or not? I do fish the zero. Um, I think it tightens that cone up a little bit. It makes you be a little bit more accurate with your bait. And you don't question, am I really on that fish? You know, it's yeah. either it's either there or it's not, and I like that. I, I hear a lot of guys when they're in the boat, and they're like, man, I wish this cone was wider. And I'm like, honestly, I think it could go thinner would be even better in my mind. 
and they're like well that just don't i'd like to see more on the screen and they're like <laughs> what else do you want to see yeah and i noticed it a lot getting into this time of year um, my last guide trip we caught a fish 22 foot deep and when you start getting down there that cone starts widening out so you're you know you can see your bait a lot more when it's not actually on target and um how would you say you lining up targets and you've got that fish at 22 that's not my favorite i like 20 and above and luckily enough the body water we're at we don't typically have to fish that deep day in and day out but what in your mind you say all right i'm really lined up with that fish yeah you're just gonna you're gonna see it all right there i mean the fish is gonna be bright and blowed up and then the bait's gonna be right there on top of him um you can get times where the fish will be really bright and the bait will kind of be faded out and it's going to be off a little bit one way or the other um, it's just all got to be as, as bright and bold as you can get it for you to really be you know right there on it what about your typical settings are you running tvg and all that kind of stuff or? i don't run any filters um, i run no noise reject no ghost reject no tvg i want a raw image i just think I can process this a little bit better I think you get a little bit more detail out of what you're looking at you know with that uh -huh. um, I don't like my color gain way up because I think it blows out the image and you know stuff starts kind of blending together and you don't really get to see that as well mm -hmm. but you know I think of all the different ways to get this stuff figured out and but what are some of the things that kind of helped you click with what you're seeing on live scope what kind of practice would you say hey get out here and try to practice this and and it'll make you a better angler when it comes to live scope open uh, water fish structure fish boat control boat control i'm gonna say that's the biggest factor in using live scope is being able to you know keep your boat where it needs to be to where you can actually fish for that fish and i have a little trick that i that i teach that really helps people with that um, i'll tell them Every time you go fishing, you know, go find something you can see. Go find a channel marker. Go find a piece of timber. Go find something that's out of the water and go up to it, get downwind of it, and just start practicing holding the boat right there. That way when you, you know, leave that and that fish is sitting out in open water, you kind of have a feel for what you're doing as far as, you know, holding the boat right there. You know, it come from my background. I, I did a lot of trolling, um, and I used my handheld remote way more than i ever did a foot control and so whenever i got used to or, or trying to live scope you know going from a handheld remote to a foot pedal is totally different animals but that's kind of like what i did i noticed a lot of times if you didn't watch it you'd run over that thing yeah but you had to kind of practice on all right i just need to press it for just, just a, a fraction second. Yeah. of a second you know, there's so many minor little movements you have to do with that troll motor in order to keep you know everything right there especially using a, a long pole casting there's a little bit more mm -hmm. um what's the word finesse uh, there's a little bit more i don't know you don't have to be quite as mm -hmm. right there you know, but when you've got that long pole in your hand you're getting within 15 feet of this fish it's all got to happen and you've got to get that boat broke down and it um you learn to feel it you learn to feel how that boat's responding to say this wave coming or you know you might even have some current or wind or whatever it may be and you learn you feel it almost ahead of time to where you can kind of go ahead and react to getting that boat in control and keeping it there did you go out and actually just practice boat control or? I, <laughs> I can remember um it's probably been four years ago i got off work one morning at probably 10 o'clock ran home grabbed the boat headed to the lake I made it to the lake, and probably 20 minutes later, my mom calls me. Hayden, what are you doing? I said, I'm fishing. She said, you know, there's like a wind advisory today. The winds are going to blow like 35, 40 miles an hour. I said, yeah, I need to practice my boat control a little bit. So I was actually up there just, you know, trying to hold the boat. I, I couldn't hold the boat very well in it, but mm -hmm. just trying to hold the boat in that wind and get a feel for what I was doing there. And you think of fishing, a lot of people are like, man, I don't, I'm not going to go out there and practice boat control because you think well i won't go fishing i'm gonna go i'm gonna throw some lines out but in reality especially starting out that boat control is you know it's huge it's huge it is how are you gonna deal with high winds i get that question asked all the time um as a lot of people probably know i fish out of a real big boat big mm -hmm. heavy boat 
Um, I didn't start there. I started in an 18 and a half foot aluminum boat and I fished in some high winds. Um, it was difficult to do sometimes just because that boat didn't want to be sitting where you were trying to make it sit. Um, it's almost a mental mindset, you know, going into, let's say it's a tournament and you're going into it in 20 mile an hour winds. You almost have to build a mental mindset before you even get out there. Um, just to almost make yourself comfortable, you know, knowing, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm going to have to deal with over the course of the day. And I think that helps me a lot. Yeah, I know. Uh, I've been guiding quite a few years, and you look at the wind, and you say, all right, well, this is the area that we're going to have to fish, and we're going to have to deal with the wind today. And lucky enough, you know, we've got so much better equipment than 10 years ago of course you know the old rangers have been around that long but you know the the back trolling motors and how much um let me see part of that spot lock trolling motors help you out in your fishing you think yeah it definitely uh, it definitely changed the way i fished when that came around you know terry stewart ran them spider rigging for yeah. a long time um and then couple people came out and started tweaking with his model a little bit and started playing with it and I, I jumped on board pretty quick and and figured out how to get a set back there and it did it it completely changed the way I fished um, I, I remember Terry Stewart and he did really good and, and everybody was like man I wonder why those trolling motors made such a difference and all of a sudden board face and sonar come out and everybody started getting it and they're like ah yeah, you, you can see it. it it is such a uh uh, it takes the word boat control to a new level you know being able to actually keep my transducer on target and stop my boat at the same time because before that you know i'm approaching a fish you've got to spin the front troll motor around if you're moving too fast yeah well when you do that you lose sight of what you're looking at mm-hmm. so you know you're guessing did the fish turn and run did the fish you don't know what he's doing in that two to three maybe five second window um, now you can keep it on target and you know stay on the fish as you're approaching him with those rear trolling motors. What about chasing down fish? And I know <laughs> you're really known to chase down these fish. And what are some of the keys to being able to chase down an open water fish? And that man, they get so hard. Even you know, for me, and I'm up front and running the trolling motor and holding this pole, but. What are some of the mind uh, the things in your mind that helps you chase down fish compared to some other people that struggle with that? Me. <laughs> I'm going to say worry less about keeping the bait in front of him and just kind of worry more on staying with the fish. You know, make sure that he doesn't make some crazy mm-hmm. turn and you, you know, oh, and you lose it or whatever. Um, you really have two different ways you can chase a fish. So if that fish is, let's say, 10 feet, 10 feet or higher in the water column i can rig a little bit heavier than i normally would and i can get the bait out in front of that fish and almost troll with him Mm -hmm. but when that fish starts sinking down you can't you know the line's going to swing so far in the boat you can't do that so then i'm then i'm pitching in front of the fish and just trying to fall in front of him as i'm going down through there and hopefully you know get in front of him in a correct presentation to where that fish will turn around on it do you Um, recall one fish that you that you i mean i've got one this spring that i remember chasing that i, I was like this has got to be like it had to be a three and a half pounder just by looking at it on the screen and i, I literally chased the fish for a quarter mile and he eventually won you ever had a fish that beat you i have i have i can remember this spring i was up on grenada um i got it eight days up there and there was one day when we really wanted a three pounder i mean we spent a full eight nine ten hours out there looking for it and it was later in the afternoon we got on a fish and when i saw it i said here it is you know this is our fish and we chased that fish for 40 something minutes um, probably <laughs> covered a little over a mile of water following this thing and uh, the fish wasn't two foot under the surface and he never reacted to a bait in 43 minutes um, the only time that fish would respond is when he ran up to a tree and met a tree. He had to decide which way he was going. But that fish beat us. Um, the person that was sitting next to me finally just said, hey, I don't think my arms can take it any longer. If you want to try it, you can. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass. I don't think that fish is even, you know, I don't think it's considering it. And we, we gave up. What do you think was, do you think that fish was spooked or just wasn't feeding? I'm, I don't know. I don't know. We never got a positive reaction out of that fish. It never even slightly looked up at a bait. 
how many times will a fish bite typically if he misses the first time? I think it depends on the fish. Um, I've had fish that never bite again after they, you know, mm-hmm. you miss them or whatever, and then I've had fish that you might miss twice or three times before you finally get a hook in it. I know that's probably the most aggravating. Me, you'll chase a fish for a while, and all of a sudden it'll miss it, or the person will miss it. I might miss it, whoever. And you're like, I don't know if I need to go back after it again or not. A lot of times, me now, I'm like, oh, forget it. there's so many fish here. Let's just don't worry about that one. Leave him for another day. He's outsmarted us. But yeah, do you typically try to go after him again, or is that just like a day-to-day thing? Yeah, I'm going to say there's a happy medium in there. Um, you're, you're reading that fish's reaction. Um, say, you, say you chase that fish down and you miss him, and then you get back on him and you try to show him that bait again, and the fish just completely ignores it okay i'm done with that fish that fish just told me i'm not interested in what you're offering i'm going to go find the next fish but maybe if you get back on that fish and he gives you somewhat of a you know look pick something else up try something different and that fish you might mess with a little bit longer if they've missed a particular bait will you put another bait and will they typically bite it or have you seen them bite a different bait it's i've seen it go both ways um one of the biggest crappie i've ever caught actually i got on and he came up a bit and i never felt anything and the fish turned and ran 15 feet and stopped again and i showed him the same bait and he bit it probably harder the second time than he did the first time i see that just rarely happens to me they usually if they miss it and i'm like man he's out he's got us he's got me i would say the craziest thing i've ever seen was at millwood we fished a tournament there last year and you could hook a fish bring him all the way to the top flop it on top him come off he'd go right back down and set up and you could drop the same bait back down there every time and catch him (laughs) we were we were in the tournament and i'm going down through there and there's a fish and i tell dad i'm like hey tournament fish you know it's pretty good fish we drop down to it i'd stick it bring it up to the top and right when it breaks the surface it comes off and i was like was that a big fish he was like i don't know well and it went right back down to set up i said well let's see and he's right down there and caught it and it was a tournament fish have you ever known to catch the same fish twice like besides that one? I can remember probably four years ago in Grenada during the summer. I was up there, and I caught a fish, took a picture of the fish with the jig in his mouth, everything, took a picture, mm-hmm. threw the fish back, and just watched him for a second. He went he went down and kind of stayed down for a minute, and then he raised back up. And when he raised back up, I was like, let's just try it. I mean, the fish was out of the water for probably 20 or 30 seconds, and the fish bit it as soon as he saw it the second time. What piece of advice would you give somebody that are just starting out with live scope? And they're like, all right, I, I went out and spent this money, bought this piece of equipment, and I know we've mentioned boat control, but what's another piece of advice would you give somebody just wanting to really get into live scope fishing? Um, I'm going to say don't set your expectations too high when you're first starting it. You know, you've, you're you starting at, let's say, ground zero, and you're working your way yeah. up, and you have to – understand that in order to not get frustrated with it um, yeah you see videos of some people using it, and it looks super easy yeah you know there's the bait coming down there's the fish and then you get out there and it's like whoa this looks you know it's harder to do than it looks and you just can't get frustrated with it you have to be willing to you know maybe even have a few bad trips um, just getting the basis getting the understanding of what's happening and then it'll finally click you know you'll see it you'll yeah. see that fish sitting down there and you'll get your bait there and from there you can start working with it i know a lot of people ask me and you know go out with somebody that knows what they're doing that's probably will speed you up faster than definitely anything else besides i mean it's like you said the videos it makes it look so easy and a lot of guys that haven't ever used it are like man this thing's you catch them every single day with it and at least i don't i mean you know we catch fish a lot and but that doesn't make them jump in the boats. I have figured out with live scoping. Absolutely. For me, it would it drove me crazy. Uh, I, I would get through my guide trip for the day, and I would go back and use this. I would troll, you know, either spider rig or long line or whatever we were doing that day, and I'd go back and put up a uh, put down the live scope and try to drop down on them and. Literally, my wife be calling me. She's like, "What are you doing? You've been out on the water for 12 hours." And I'm like, "This thing is about to drive me crazy." It can be frustrating. Um, it took me three to four months 
to be able to say that's a crappie here comes my bait mm -hmm. I'm, i mean when i first started with it it was just dots on the screen and i'm trying to see this jig go down to it and you finally start to pick up you know what you're looking at what about like you got a fish set up what is a mistake people do when they are right, you got a fish suspended at 10 foot what is the proper way to have a jig in most scenarios drop down on a fish um, then pay attention to your water clarity you know fish can see farther than you think they can and a lot of times i feel that you get too close to that fish and almost startle that fish in a way i'm um, like going into the fall our lakes are starting to clear up a lot these fish are starting to get where they can see two or three feet so a lot of times when i go down to that fish i'm going to stop way above him and just see if he doesn't because a lot of times that fish will kind of you know he can feel that coming and um I try to stay as far away from the fish as they'll let me just to kind of maybe not let him profile what I'm doing or see something he doesn't like. And it, it gets those fish a lot more curious. I feel like whenever you do that, what's the best way to identify between, I know I, I've seen somebody uh, ask one, one of the comments I posted this week, but, um, between let's say a, uh, white bass and a crappie, as far as seeing them on the screen, you can say automatically, I know that's a white bass. Automatically, I know that's a crappie or, or a gaspagoo or freshwater drums, if, if you might hear them as. But what are some of the ways that you identify different fish species compared to other ones? Yeah, I'm going to say with a crappie. Catfish, even. I mean, there's tons of catfish. A, a cat. I have a trick for catfish, and I can show it, you know, to whoever's sitting next to me and, and they can catch it because it's it's very distinct he's almost going to come across as two dots you know you're going to mm -hmm. see his head up here and then his tail's going to be back here and there's almost going to be a void in there in between that fish's head and tail um, and it allows you to pick that up and when you see it you can say okay that's catfish um, your bigger scaled fish are going to show you a much hotter return much brighter return so if you're pointed at a fish let's say there's a fish just suspended in open water and you point at him and it throws a ray up the back side of that screen immediately no that's not a crappie write it off i've never seen a crappie throw you know that hot beam off the back mm -hmm. of him what you're hitting is you're hitting a gar you're hitting a drum you're hitting some with a big scale and that image is bouncing off of him um that crappie is almost going to absorb some of that he's going to be a more faint image um almost ghost-like in certain scenarios mm -hmm. um bass are always moving they never stop very rarely do i see a bass just you know sitting in open yeah. water or sit, they might sit on a stump every now and then, but if it's a group of bass, they're on the go. They're going somewhere. I think you read my mind because I was going to ask you about this whole bass thing. I know you're <laughs> dabbling with it nowadays too. I've been playing with it some. I mean, just I was a bass fisherman way before I was a crappie fisherman, and it it's fun. It gave me something to do. Um, I for the last four or five years, I wasn't even looking for a bass on a live scope. You know, I was looking for crappie, 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 and I didn't know what a bass looked like for the longest time. And so I finally just told myself, go see, you know, what you can do with a bass rod and a bass and see if you can't catch a few of them. How hard are, is, is it harder to target bass than crappie, you think? I can't make them bite. I will say that. Um, and I think a lot of the reason behind that is I've played with the crappie so much as far as making him bite. And then you throw a different species in there and it, you know, that fish reacts different. There's so many different baits that you can show a bass compared to a crappie. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm lost in all that trying to figure it out. So it's a whole new puzzle game. That's then. right. That's right. And I enjoy puzzles. Um, <laughs> I like I like challenging myself when I go fishing. Um, I think you you know it really helps build you as an angler. Challenging yourself, you know, put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, go fishing on the days that it's not beautiful and pretty. Um, and go to the lakes that you don't hear the hottest fish yeah, report at. Yeah, I, uh, I remember this spring I went to a lake. It's called Wasp Lake. Have you ever heard of Wasp yeah. Lake? I went and spent eight hours on it I've looking, never looking been for to crappie. It. And why? I don't know. I don't know what struck me to go there, but I just wanted to go see something different. And I spent eight hours on that lake and might have caught six or eight fish. And I didn't expect, you know, to catch a lot of fish going into it, but it was a learning curve. I wanted to see what I can do. Um, I enjoy new bodies of water. I feel like there's a lot to learn, you know, stepping into a new body of water. Yeah. And you can really kind of test what you're, you know, 
what you've built, you know, as far as patterns and different things like that, you can test it when you show up to a body of water that, let's say, doesn't even have a lake map, you know. You have to just almost fish off a feel to, to find those fish. Do you see, like, the catfish inside of uh, – I know a lot of those guys have got live scope now, but do you think live scope could be a game changer with catfish? Absolutely. I um, There was a tournament come to Barnett last year. I was out there one day on a guide trip, and I drove across the spillway, and there was all these boats out there catfishing. I said, what are they doing? And then I get around to the ramp I was using, and sure enough, there was a trailer set up, and it was a tournament. So I kind of looked into it and started watching, and nobody was using it. I said, well, I wish I would have known this would have came to town. I would have went and tried it just to see. I see catfish every day. I'm sure you do too. Yep. Um, I've never tried to actually present a bait to a catfish and see how he responded to it, but I definitely think um, they're, they're targetable. Let me make sure this thing's still working. But oh yeah, I think we're still good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> I think it's so interesting that um, y- you know it hasn't been really fully utilized. I don't think in the catfishing side of things. I keep saying, and I've been saying it for probably a year and a half now that I was going to go out there and see if I couldn't identify a forty-pound catfish or whatever, and drop a bait down there and see if he wouldn't bite it. Um, I've yet to try it. It's something that I want to try. I just haven't set the time aside to go do it. Well, what do you think was the, some of the craziest things you've seen with live scope? Any fish species, whether it be a crappie or a gar or whatever. It's got to be something that you said, wow. There's, it's really, I've talked about this to a few of my friends. Um, something's happening when the sun first starts to come up and the sun just starts to set um something's happening to the water the actual i don't know if it's a plankton coming off the bottom or what it is but um early in the morning you'll get out there and you'll see a ton of crappie and they might not be but a foot or two under the surface and the bottom half of your screen is super hazy super fuzzy and then as that sun starts to peak up that thing falls out within a matter of like 10 minutes well then the fish can go back down it's Mm -hmm. almost like whatever this layer is the fish don't really care to sit in it and you see the same thing in the evenings like the fish might be at let's say 14 feet and then the sun starts to go down and next thing you know that whatever that line is i've actually watched it come off bottom and just kind of start easing up yeah and it pushes the fish with it that's probably the weirdest thing i've seen with live scope that i still don't understand fully what in your mind would be the hardest style to catch crappie with live scope would it be chasing them open water or laying on the bottom or laying on the bottom <laughs> uh, let's hear it it's uh it's it's very tricky you have to be able to see something you know you can't just drop them i guess you could just drop and drag on the bottom yeah. and hope to see something raise up but um, that's fishing there i studied it for a two or three month period on eagle lake you know those mm-hmm. fish are notorious for going to the bottom and staying down there and I spent a lot of time over there messing with them. Um, basically just started dropping on those glowing hot spots that I saw on the bottom, and it took hours and hours and hours before I was finally able to see a dot down there and somewhat identify it. Hmm. I'm trying to keep <laughs> on grilling you here. Now, man. I will say, out of all the tournaments I've won, I've only won – one or two catching fish off the bottom i know that was a big thing that a lot of people were saying he's got to be fishing the bottom he's got to be fishing the bottom there was only one or two instances where that really played a factor and do you think uh, like on bottom fish is there a settings that make it jump out any better or i'm, I'm not, not really? sure i've had my settings stuck for the last two or three years so i don't really don't get, i don't it? play with it much i don't even change the color or anything what color are you using i use aqua yeah, um, no, it's, it's it's a super I don't know it just you use it works with my eyes I don't know <laughs> yeah, I guess it does work with your eyes I it's like uh, black emerald and um, aqua almost seems to be a little bit softer of a color mm-hmm. um, palette mm-hmm. uh oh that battery might be Battery dead. battery's almost dead keep on where you go that color yeah aqua's a it's a softer color palette and I think that allows you to bump your gain and color gain up just a touch and get a little bit more detail out of it. Well, guys, I had Peyton <laughs> here home. Uh, we'll get him on again. He lives right down the road. I see him all the time on the water. 
uh, usually we're waving at each other going by each other every day but uh, appreciate your time yeah, bro heck yeah and uh we'll get you down here on crappie connection again hit that subscribe button hit the like follow this guy on facebook and all the other social media stuff you're on everything that's right next time you got brad chapel here hayden jeffers follow about a mile from big muddy river place i'll always remember Cabin on the lake and a fishing pole Forever here I'll rest my soul I can feel my worries drift away